be care at that time when the doors were closed, oh, Dr. Mr. David Speaker. Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, Mr. Maclay has certainly enhanced his reputation with that speech. Uh, uh, well, he's enhanced his reputation for not letting the facts get in the way of a good story. Uh, we know that that member uh, oversaw the select committee process. He's reminded us of that fact, and he has tried to suggest to this House that it was a generous process, that it was a process where all submitters were heard uh, and where due consideration was taken. Well, uh, Mr Chair, nothing could be further from the truth. In the interests of uh, gutting the forestry sector in his own electorate, uh, what, what one might uh, consider an ill-conceived uh, attempt to make his own seat a marginal one, uh, Mr Maclay uh, has pushed ahead with this legislation without the full process that we'd normally expect around this kind of major uh, legislation with implications for New Zealand's international reputation. So National rushed this bill through the House to meet its December deadline of the transitional period ending. Uh, and its reason for doing this was that it said there had already been a significant review. Uh, but the great irony there is that the Select Committee did not listen to or did not take heed of the recommendations of that review. And indeed, in the Select Committee process as it was provided, uh, there was not adequate time for full submissions. Many submitters said there was not adequate time for full submissions due to the short period of time allocated for this process. And instead of the usual four to six months, that we would expect for a piece of legislation uh, of this nature to be going through the Select Committee process, the Bill received just seven weeks. Seven weeks. Seven weeks. It was basically a rubber stamping exercise. This piece of legislation was rushed through the Select Committee process. That's why, yes, $1.3 billion a year it costs to run uh, this. And and $200 million a week. $200 million a week, Mr Mallard says, for select committee time to rush a process like this through. Uh, a mockery, a rubber stamping exercise. It's not adequate. And what we see as a result, of course, is $328 million uh, more cost to the taxpayer and industries that are doing good things uh, up for the chop, jobs going in the forestry sector and Mr Maclay's own electorate uh, as a result of these changes. And those who are doing uh, things that are the old way of doing things um, are advantaged. Those who are not willing to uh, make the transition to adopt new technologies that are climate friendly uh, are rewarded, and those that are actually making that change are punished for the additional costs of stepping up to make the change to gear up for the economy of the future. This is shameful. Um, and as I said, the government justified this short select committee process on the basis uh, that it was preceded by an extended period of ministerial consultation with key stakeholders. Now, the interesting point to note around that is that the key stakeholders did not include the environmental sector. <laughs> A piece of environmental legislation and key stakeholders did not include the environmental sector. Now, that's what the National Party calls balance. So this piece of legislation, let's remind ourselves why it's here, because uh, the SOP in the name of Moana Mackey, uh, which proposes that we um, allow for New Zealand units to have a more prominent role uh, and it places an obligation on participants surrendering credits for a minimum uh, of 50 per cent being uh, New Zealand units, that's the, the aim of this SOP number 142 in Moana Mackey's name. Uh, this, this would make sure that the price that is artificially low at the moment uh, because of uncertainty around future agreements um, is, is kept, and, and because of the global financial crisis, is kept at a reasonable level so that uh, those who are in the space of making positive contributions to our climate are uh, supported through the transition period to a, to a fuller carbon price. Um, that, that, that SOP needs to be put in the context of the Kyoto Protocol and New Zealand's wider obligations. Now we know that the Kyoto Protocol was set up because New Zealand uh, wants to be a part of the solution. The, the Protocol, sorry, Kyoto Protocol. My pronunciation is corrected. Thank you, Mr. Chevelle. 
um, <laughs> uh, in line with a previous contribution. Um, we, we know that this protocol, Mr Chair, Dr David Clark, uh, aims to ensure that the world addresses climate change as a whole. New Zealand uh, is stepping forward to do its share, uh, when it, or at least it was stepping forward when Jenny Shipley signed it in 1998, uh, joining 191 countries and the European community uh, in signing that protocol, and when Helen Clark ratified it. New Zealand has made it clear that it intended to do its bit, and subsequently we saw all kinds of behaviours as people prepared for the scheme to be introduced. We saw forests felled faster than they normally would as those uh, with interest in converting to dairying got on with that business before the emissions trading scheme was introduced. And then, sure enough, when the scheme was introduced, those activities dropped off. And we saw New Zealand starting to begin on a path toward a more sustainable future. Now, since that time, since the national government came to office, we have seen backwards steps. We have seen, of course, under the global financial crisis, the price of international emissions units drop, plummet uh, exponentially. We've, we know of the, of the Russian hot air, uh, which makes for very, very cheap units, and we know the effect that that has had on the international carbon price as, uh, as with global financial uh, crisis. Um, production has slowed in many industrialised countries, and we know that that has meant that the carbon price is artificially low at the moment, and that uh, you know we need to be, if we're going to do our bit, we need to find ways of ensuring that that carbon price is more realistic, is in line with long-term expectations of what it will cost to address climate change. Now, the science tells us that the probability of climate change being natural, i.e., not uh, human-induced, is less than five percent. There are still some who would doubt the science, uh, who think it's all a conspiracy theory. Uh, but the science, um, I, I'm not a scientist, but as a policy maker, I'm inclined to believe the scientists because uh, there seems to be a strong consensus around the issue. They say we should be taking steps now because it's cheaper to address these things now than to deal with the effects of runaway climate change later. So when we signed up to the Kyoto Protocol, uh, New Zealand, under Jenny Shipley in 1998 and then subsequently under Helen Clark, had to then effect a mechanism to ensure that our obligations were met. There are basically three broad options for doing that. Uh, one is to have a carbon tax, and we know that that didn't succeed politically. Um, subsequently, when the Business Roundtable proposed it, uh, of course we all smelt a rat, you know when the Business Roundtable proposes a tax that uh, there's something a little bit fishy going on. Um, but what was, what was uh, sustained and supported by the Green Party, introduced by the Labour Party, was an emissions trading scheme. And that was better in the long run than having taxpayers subsidise polluters. Rather than taxpayers encouraging polluting activity forever, a scheme that ensured that we started to attribute the actual costs of pollution in our country, our costs that New Zealand incurs under the Kyoto Protocol, uh, to back to those who were generating them, so that their behaviour would change, so that a price incentive would encourage behaviour to change, so that those who were employing newer, cleaner, greener, high-tech uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, business uh, solutions would succeed, and those who were not willing to change would face challenges and be forced to change their behaviour, make future investment decisions that were smart and in New Zealand's long-term interest. That's why the, the scheme was introduced. But what we've seen from this government, uh, as those international market prices have gone into free fall, is a general acceptance of that hot air, of the limited change it brings, and of the way in which it slows down the transformation of our economy to one that is ready to tackle climate change and ready to lead the way in terms of research and development, uh, in terms of introducing new technologies that are better for the planet and actually generate a better return for New Zealand. Now, this is, this is uh, I suppose, at least consistent with a government that is not in any hurry, it seems, to get our economy back on track. It's got the worst economic record of any government in the last 50 years. So we see that it's not willing to step in and make the big choices to actually help us transition to a low-carbon economy. It's, uh, in fact, extending subsidies for the foreseeable future. Moana Mackey's supplementary order paper, number 142, uh, allows these New Zealand credits to have a, 
uh, significant standing in the market. It places obligations on participants to surrender credits for a minimum of 50 per cent of their emissions units. Mr Chair. Uh, Maggie Barry. I move.